larger, I don't know if this is our largest crowd or not, but it, I know we had over 100 people sign up, so this is really great turnout. Amazing. Thank everybody for coming. Um, sponsors for this, uh, our food is sponsored by our last con, our Lone Star Application Security Conference, which uh, helps uh, help pay for the food for the, these monthly meetings. And also the facilities, uh, National Instruments, uh, providing our venue here, that's great. Chapter leadership, um, I'm Tiana Chandler, the chapter leader, and uh, we have other uh, chapter leaders here as well. Um, I don't know if we want to just have people just raise their hands or just we'll just move on. But if you if you know these folks, uh, if you have any questions about the chapter, please come see us. For CPEs, right now what I'd like to do is uh, if you've signed up through Eventbrite, uh, we have your email address, and just send me an email um, reply to that where uh, I can get a certificate to you if that's what you want to have as far as proof of attendance. Chapter information, uh, memberships, uh, you do not have to be an OWASP member to attend these meetings or to participate in other projects or use materials produced by OWASP, uh, but it is encouraged to give back to the, the uh, organization. Um, supporting OWASP, uh, there's volunteer opportunities. Uh, you can come talk to us if you're interested in helping out with the leadership. Uh, speaker opportunities like this one and uh, getting involved in local events. If you do any purchases on Amazon, there's the Amazon Smile that you, if you select that when you purchase, it'll, that uh, portion of that uh, will actually be going towards uh, OWASP itself. As far as our study group goes, uh, Matt Pardo, where are you at here? Where's Matt? Maybe he's not here right now. Anyway, uh, oh, he's at the door. So uh, currently he's leading a study group. Uh, we just started this last week. It's Black Hat Python, and we meet every Thursday here at NI, but at a Building A. So if you're interested, uh, we also have a Slack channel we're using to uh, have the communication and whether it's status or just talking about the having discussions on the book. And if you have any questions, you can, there's Matt Pardo in the back. And uh, Matt, there was another study group that you had going on, and I couldn't remember the details of that. And um, on our uh, Austin uh, OWASP wiki page, um, I'm getting putting in, up information about the study group, so I'll get that information and put it up there as well. Some upcoming conferences, we do have, there's B-Sides that's going to be in May and the registration is now open. And my understanding is if you're uh, uh, interested in the uh, uh, the operations aspect of it, then there's uh, DevOps days. That's going to be that same week. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. And, uh, Matt Pardo is leading B-Sides, so I just wanted to recognize him as well. How much? How much is it, Matt? Only thirty dollars. Um, other upcoming chapter events. Uh, also, just call, recognizing Matt Pardo because he's our uh, education coordinator. But 
he's also looking into other training opportunities, so uh, just stay tuned and we may be announcing some other things. Uh, and also the Austin Security Professionals Happy Hour, which is a joint effort with the uh, ISSA and the next one's coming up February 9th at Sherlock Safer Street Pub. And if you're not on the mailing list um, for the OWASP Austin, uh, you can join that and then I usually send out emails for that. And then uh, just listing here some other upcoming local events. Uh, does anybody have any other events they would want to announce? Thank you. Um, our next meeting will be on February 15th, which is always the third Wednesday of the month. It's held at the Norris Conference Center, uh, right next to the Walmart on um, Anderson and Burnett. Thanks. I am uh, Bunkim Tejani, as Tiana mentioned, um, one of the, the chapter leaders and the conference coordinator for LASCON. The so LASCON is coming up again in October. Um, and we'll have that. Uh, you'll see more info in the next uh, month or two about uh, registration and also our CFP and so forth. Um, but uh, one other thing I wanted to mention is um, Agile Austin has a security SIG, which I'll, I'll be restarting. Uh, so the first meeting will probably be later in towards the end of February or the beginning of March. Um, but it'll be monthly meetings as well. We'll do some partnership with the OWASP uh, chapter uh, where we can. Um, but that's uh, also another venue to talk about um, agile development and security. Thank you. And uh, if there's any other information you'd like to find out more about uh, the OWASP chapter, there's austin.os.org. I did want to mention one thing that our foundation has asked us to uh, uh, note is that the foundation is uh, the staff and board updated a 2017 OWASP overview and it's on our main page under participation, so if you want to check that out and learn more, uh, then uh, that'll be some new information they just published. And now uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Richard Moles is Vice President of Strategy for Whitewood, Boston-based startup focused on random number generation. He has more than 15 years experience in the security industry with a focus on cryptography. He has worked with customers in the areas of card and mobile payments, PKI, storage encryption, hardware security modules, and enterprise key management. He's participated in OWASP, PCI DSS, OASIS, CSA, and Quantum Safe Industry Groups, and is the author of Key Management for Dummies. So please welcome Richard Moles. <laughs> Everybody, it's working. Can you hear me? Okay? I can't hear it, so it must be very subtle. What I have to do? Share my screen. That one there. Perfect. How's lunch? Yeah? Wonderful. It's always great. To, uh, the opportunity to come and speak in Austin. Living in Boston, we're due to get four inches of snow this afternoon. I think it's about 26 degrees right now in my backyard. So uh, to come to Austin in January, I'll always say yes to that one. Absolutely. No question. You know, warm the, warm the bones up, as it were. Um, okay, so you know who I am. So who are you, who are you guys? Are you, who's, a, who's a developer in here? Oh, most of you must be. He's an IT security guy, person. What are all the rest of you there? <laughs> student? No student? Academics? No academics? So, what are you just sitting off the street? Just, you know, <laughs> waiting for the shops to open or something? <laughs> all right. So we talk about uh, random numbers. So I'm uh, amazed that there is this, uh, this turnout. Um, you know, this is a pretty uh, emerging area. I think people have been taking random number generation uh, and the subject of entropy in general for granted for a, uh, for a long time. Uh, but I think that's starting to change. There's some, some new standards coming along uh, that I'll talk about uh, and hopefully give you a sense of, sort of where, 
where the industry is in terms of its thinking about random number generation. It's been a sort of cottage industry for the last 25 years or so, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's about to become somewhat professionalized. Uh, so my background is key management. Um, uh, well, it was a pretty new company. We're only about 18 months or so uh, old. We're based in Boston. And we're essentially a technology spin out from Los Alamos National Lab in, uh, in New Mexico. They have a large quantum crypto and quantum communications uh, group there. And uh, they actually did a big technology transfer, um, the biggest tech transfer that Los Alamos had ever done, and it still is. And, uh, and Whitewood was created to commercialize some of the products that came out of that uh, development team. So happy to talk about that if people uh, are interested. Anyone going to RSA in a couple of weeks? Just a couple. Okay. Well, we're there, so if you want to come by our booth and get demos and stuff, then we're at booth uh, 3443. Okay, I'll start talking about cryptography only because it's um, it's sort of the most demanding application for random numbers. You know, almost every application, whatever it does, whether it's finding process IDs or randomizing memory or whatever, uh, or even doing a you know, gaming application uses random numbers. Um, if you actually instrument the operating system to see how many random numbers are being requested. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's kilobytes or even hundreds of kilobytes uh, a second. So the most demanding application is for uh, cryptography and for encryption. And of course, these days, we seem to be encrypting more and more. The percentage of the internet of internet traffic is being encrypted. Uh, the percentage of uh, data at rest and stored information is being encrypted uh, is going through the roof. You think about Bitcoin. You think about IoT security. You think about the rollout of PKI and certificate signatures and all the rest of it. Um, and then you think about the joys of, of quantum crypto and the threat of quantum computing and the role that random plays in all of that. This is, this is going to be, I think, a more serious issue. Um, so when we think about cryptography, obviously we're thinking about encryption, we're thinking about digital signing, uh, and we're thinking about digital certificates. Um, you know, it's hard to think how most of the digital world we live in these days in terms of applications and in terms of online banking and mobile applications and the IoT, you know, none of this stuff could really happen without the existence of crypto. There's not some other sorts of ways of protecting data. You know, crypto is pretty much it. We can argue about the algorithms and how those algorithms will change over time, but you know, crypto is pretty much the way to go. And I'm sure some of you, um, you know, are dealing with the issues of deploying encryption and deploying cryptography and managing keys for the first time. Key management evolving from you know, essentially cottage industry into a into a sort of formal enterprise discipline uh, fairly quickly as well. So when we think about um, crypto, uh, it's easy to get bogged down uh, and think about, of course, the algorithms. People talk about RSA and AES and elliptic curve. Um, but it's really nothing, the algorithms are sort of simple, the algorithms are not secret, the algorithms can be printed on a t-shirt, that's not where the security of crypto com comes from, you know, obviously it comes from uh, the keys themselves, they're the secrets, it's just like the lock on your front door um, at home, you know, I could go see which lock you're using, which manufacturer, I could probably go on the internet and find an exploded view of how that lock actually works, so that's not the issue, the issue is what's the shape of the key that's in your pocket, and how many other people have got copies of the shape of the key that's in your pocket, and how easy would it be for me to go guess the shape of the key that's in your pocket and run down to Home Depot and get one made and go and try it, and if it was the right guess, yeah, I'd be in your house and you would never know. So that's the, that's the issue we face when we think about random number generation and key management, because the two are inextricably linked together. The key, at the end of the day, is just a very long random number. So we think about, uh, you know, while this becomes more and more important, of course, um, data leaves our perimeter. You know, the, 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 the decades old notion of a perimeter around a company, I'm sure you've had that presentation uh, many, many times. I'm sure you um, would, wouldn't uh, argue with the notion that the perimeter is largely evaporating uh, already in terms of data leaving the business, moving to cloud computing, uh, the various partner networks that exist. So data lives outside of our control most of the time. Um, and of course, it does that needs to be protected. And the only thing that separates that data from the bad guys and the people that are trying to steal that information in, is the quality of that key. So insiders will try and steal keys. Outsiders will try and guess keys. Um, the world of hardware security modules and tamper-resistant computing and all that stuff is about preventing people from stealing keys and misusing keys 
the world around the number generation is all around trying to make sure that nobody can plausibly guess at it. And um, I think the reason why this is becoming more and more relevant is because um, it's getting, you know, in principle, harder and harder and harder for us to generate sufficient random numbers because we're doing more and more crypto. We're generating more and more keys. Every single SSL connection has an ephemeral AES key. So we're generating more and more encryption keys. You think about the IoT you know, forecast of 20 billion connected devices within you know, half a dozen years or so, you know, all calling home with your gas meter readings or the latest map update or you know, turn left to the next traffic signal or even turn, the, turn on the next traffic signal and create some incredible amount of key management and key consumption. So we generate, we, we require more and more uh, random numbers. It's getting harder and harder to generate random numbers because we're moving our applications into virtualized environments where there's less and less entropy, which is the characteristic you need to ensure randomness in, in a random number. And of course, the bad guy's ability to guess random numbers is increasing all the time. As every day goes by, the bad guy gets a faster and faster computer which means they can make more and more guesses to generate, and therefore uh, shorten the window to, uh, to, to, to guess any particular encryption key. And then, of course, NIST comes along and says, you know, we should double all the length of our encryption keys, so all of a sudden we need twice as much entropy. So we like to think we can, uh, we can make random numbers. Uh, the whole proposition of cryptography is that these keys can't be guessed. Um, even with the biggest computer in the world, you know, we like to believe in the crypto community, that even with unlimited resources, it would be infeasible to get you know, any one of these keys. Um, unfortunately, there were studies. There was a, a study done a couple of years ago uh, in the University of Pennsylvania that found that something like three or four percent of all of the SSL keys on the internet today around the world are the same. And that sh should be entirely, entirely impossible. There should be as many combinations of these keys as there are atoms in the universe. So the the chance of any two keys on the planet being the same should be infinitesimally small, never mind a small single digit percentage of all keys being the same. And of course the reason why they're the same is because they weren't random. And the, the reason why they weren't random is because there was insufficient entropy in the system that generated it. Some of you may have seen uh, over the holidays, uh, and maybe, maybe that's why it was over the holidays, um, there was a follow-up to this same report that outed some vendors that had actually been uh, found to have insufficiently random numbers, uh, and Siemens issued a patch for a fairly innocuous looking HVAC controller for building management, but it turned out had, had zero entropy. And uh, Siemens, of course, had to fix this thing because it turned out that its SSL connections uh, were therefore very vulnerable. Um, so to their credit, Siemens did something about it. But the 20 or so other vendors that were outed in the support so far haven't done anything about it. So, uh, uh, if you want to, uh, the easiest way of finding the story, if you go to my uh, my LinkedIn page, Richard Mould, uh, on LinkedIn, I wrote a blog about it last week, so that contains a link to the story if you want to dig into it more details. In the story, it takes you to the uh, University of Pennsylvania paper that actually explains the research and, uh, and how they did it and what the vulnerability was. So, this is becoming, I think, uh, quite pressing. Um, here's a bunch of uh, more historic stories. I should update the slide with the, uh, the latest uh, Siemens uh, story. Even though it's only an HVAC controller, I think, hey, you know, what's the vulnerability of somebody hacking into an HVAC controller? Um, but I think that's only one step away from somebody hacking into the thing that controls the elevators, which is only one step away from somebody hacking into the thing that controls a mass transit system, or a driver's vehicle, or a drone, or the airplane that's going to fly. Uh, me home this afternoon, which is a bit scary. Um, I think one of the issues with uh, random number attacks is that it's, in some ways, it's the perfect attack. If you can manipulate somebody's random number generator, then you can steal their data, and there's no way for them to know. If you had two servers on the table, one with a hacked RNG and one without, looking from the outside, you couldn't tell which one was the bad one. But even if I told you you'd been hacked, even if I told you your system had a back door, you wouldn't be able to find it. So that's the perfect attack. Some people refer to that as, as, as cryptography, using cryptography to steal things. Um, and of course, the evidence that this is, this is an attack of choice is that supposedly um, the NSA tried to do this. Some of you may remember um, three or three and a half years or so ago, um, NIST had to hastily withdraw 
one of the standards for a random number generator because it had become exposed that NSA had supposedly uh, weakened the RNG algorithm inside uh, around another generator called a dual EC DRBG. And um, so what that said was somebody that wanted to plan the perfect attack and someone that had the ability uh, to go exploit a weakened RNG you know, would actually go do this. Um, so who knows whether there have been others over the years. Um, this was the one that just got found. Um, so who knows how good or bad uh, RNGs are right now. So, think a little bit about randomness and what's the difference between good and bad randomness. So, of course, when we think about chance and randomness, we think about rolling a dice. So my graph, you probably can't read the numbers, but that's just the probability of something happening. So if I have a perfect fair die, then I've got an equal probability of throwing a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. If I have two dice, then I have, a, I have a, an interesting profile. You know, I'm, I won't ask whether anybody uh, was aware that the, the probability of throwing all the numbers from one from two to twelve rather in a two dice throw is flat, but of course it's not. Six times more likely that you'll throw um, a seven than a two or a twelve. Um, and of course, if I had a loaded dice, then my goal I wouldn't always achieve it. Of course, is to guarantee the answer that would come from my loaded dice. So one of the things that we would want to do, of course, is to test the output of a random number generator to prove that it was generating truly random numbers which is a great idea, because if it were true, which it's not, sadly, um, then I could go test all the keys that I'm generating. I could go test all the keys that I'm going to use to generate an SSL connection, for example, and just throw away all the unrandom ones. But sadly, you can't tell retrospectively whether a number is random or not. You can do statistical analysis over 100 rolls of the dice, or a million keys, or a billion keys that have been generated, and you'd like to think you'd find some uniformity. You'd like to think that you'd find a lack of bias between ones and zeros, or between two-digit numbers, or four-digit numbers, or 16-byte numbers, or whatever. And you come to some conclusion that the data seemed to be uniformly distributed, which would be a, a good sign of confidence. But even that wouldn't tell you that the thing was actually random in the sense of being unpredictable. So, you know, I have two numbers here, big one and a small one. You know, which of those two numbers is the most random number? No idea? I'll give you a clue. First one, seven. Yeah, I got seven. Yeah, I really did in my hotel room. Throw two dice this morning, got seven. Um, of course, the number on the right is pi. Now, pi, pi passes all the tests. The randomness, the digits of pi, which carry on forever, are perfectly uh, uniformly distributed. So pi passes the test of randomness, but of course would be a disastrous key to use because it's not in any way unpredictable. It's entirely predictable. So retrospectively, even a number that seems, if I had a million bits of data, you know, and they, they seemed, sometimes you even see people, and there have even been proposals, believe it or not, to, to turn data into an image, if it looks like gray, you know, white noise, then it must be random. And if you can't see any shapes or patterns or lines or dots or whatever in the thing, then it must be unrandom. You know, nice idea, but it doesn't really fly in practice. Um, so you need to know where these numbers come from. You need to know what physical process was at the, at the, at the base of the thing being generated in the first place. You need to know something about the history and the provenance of these numbers have a sense of whether or not they're random, even if they seem to be uniformly distributed. So believe it or not, there's no certification scheme yet for random number generators. Um, I'll pass that in a moment. I'll, I'll, I'll dig into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. But right now, uh, at least in terms of proving the randomness of a source of entropy, there's no current standard. And the reason why is because it's an incredibly difficult standard to write. You know, how do you certify, you can't certify a number as being random, how do you certify a device that makes them as being random? So even though we have lots of certification schemes for crypto systems, some of you may, may either buy or manufacture um, products that are certified to FIPS 140. Anyone familiar with FIPS 140? It's essentially a mandate in the government for 
certify crypto systems from an implementation point of view and also from a key management point of view. But even FITS on 40 doesn't certify the quality of the entropy source that's being used to generate random numbers. So even if you go and spend you know, $50,000 on your hardware security module to lock down your keys in a tamper resistant box to do all your payment processing, whatever it is you're going to do, even that device hasn't had its entropy source certified as being truly random because there was no standard. So NIST um, issues, standards of technology um, are trying to close that gap and have a draft standard uh, called SP 800 uh, 90B, which is attempting to create a certification scheme for measuring and certifying products against a test for randomness, which does include some statistical tests of actually analyzing blocks of data you know, in various different directions and various different configurations. But it also looks at the architecture and the claims of the system and defines certain health tests that need to be in place to go build on these products. So this draft came out uh, last, uh, early last year. Uh, it's in, it went through a public review period, uh, and it, it, in principle, could be uh, launched at any time. And the notion is this will be included uh, in FIPS on 40, so it'll become part of uh, crypto system certification scheme going forward. There's quite a few. There's a, there's a bewildering array of statistical mathematical tests for analyzing the randomness of data. Uh, there's a chap called Shannon. Uh, 60 years ago, came up with some measurements uh, for entropy, um, but none of those have been particularly codified into a, into a standard as yet, and tied to an architecture assessment of results uh, in a product. So you have to be very treat with a uh, uh, an open mind any claims of randomness testing and the outputs of any randomness tests. Um, some of them are useful, but you have to be careful how you use them and on, and on what sort of data you try and test. Okay, so why is making random numbers so difficult? You'd think it'd be easy. I mean, there's billions and billions and billions of random numbers made every second across the planet. You'd think it'd be dead easy. Um, it turns out it's not, uh, because virtually all random numbers are made by the operating system. So applications don't make their own random numbers. Applications ask the operating system for a random number, which it duly gets presented with. The trouble is, of course, operating systems, like any application, um, just do what they're programmed to do. Uh, deterministic systems uh, don't do random things. Um, when a piece of software does something random, we call it a bug. We don't call it a feature, we call it a bug. It's something we have to go fix. And we want to get rid of all this random behavior, um, which in 99.9% .9 of the time is true, uh, except when, when we want it to make a random number. So we have these things called pseudo random number generators, which sounds like an oxymoron. Uh, and NIST go even one step further, and they call it a deterministic random bit generator, which sounds even more like uh, an oxymoron. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds, and, uh, and I'll explain in a minute. This is not, of course, a new argument. Uh, you know, one of the, the grandfathers of our industry 60-odd uh, years ago said, you know, anybody who thinks that a, an algorithm can make a random number is, is deluding themselves. So in our operating systems, Windows, Linux, all the rest of them, they all have pseudo random number generators built into them. And these things are standardized. Now, there is a NIST standard, that is three, for pseudo random number generators. And the, uh, and the, and the, the RNG I said earlier had been uh, removed because of the weakened, weakening of the, uh, of, of, of the RNG algorithm was one of those sets. So it was the PRNG. Uh, so pseudo random number generators, they generate random numbers. But they have to be randomized. They have to be seeded with something that's random. So you have a small amount of perfect entropy going in. Entropy is just is the measure of randomness. So we tend to you know, use it as a, as, a, as a noun as well as a measure. Um, so you seed these things, uh, which then generate potentially you know, gigabits, uh, hundreds of gigabits, thousands of gigabits of data to be consumed by the operating system. Um, but PRNG can't add entropy. So the randomness of the output is no greater than the randomness of the input, except the number of bits is massively greater. So think of it as, um, think of it like an audio amplifier. You can put a small signal in, and you can have a huge signal out enough to drive you know, a PA system. So there's no musicality being added along the way. The only musicality of the output is what went on in the input. Okay, so we boosted the volume. So you can think of a PRNG 
day and amplifier for data doesn't add randomness, it just amplifies it across a greater number of bits. Enough to service you know, a high speed application crunching out thousands of SSL connections a second, which consumes megabits of random data. So the analogy I like to use for this is like, uh, it's the difference between dealing a deck of cards and shuffling a deck of cards. So if I had a, you know, essentially an infinite deck of cards and it came out of the plastic wrapping and the thing was, you know, uh, was uh, contiguous, you know, ace of hearts to, to a heart, etc. Uh, then you could obviously predict, and I went around the room and I started dishing out cards, the folks at the end of the room would have a decent guess about what card they suppose they're about to be dealt. So of course we don't do that, we don't play cards that way, we shuffle the deck before we deal the deck, uh, and the more we bother to shuffle the deck, the less deterministic the deal becomes. Okay, so think, think of the process of shuffling the deck and the process of dealing the deck as being very different. You know, one is about adding randomness, one's not. Um, and once you seed an operating system, you know, in principle you can stop seeding it, and it will then continue delivering random bits to applications that call for random numbers you know, essentially forever. Eventually, it will start to repeat itself, um, but that's you know, in the orders of you know, 2 to the 30, 2 to the 40 bits, so that's a very, very long time. The question is, which deal are you on? And that's where the randomness comes from. So where does this entropy come from? Where does seeding come from? So in a, in a situation uh, such as this, we have a traditional stack with applications running on an operating system, running on a bit of hardware. Uh, in our hardware, we have CPUs doing things, we have networks doing things, we have disks doing things. Um, we have our PRNG, our pseudo random number generator, generating numbers for the apps. And it's trying to scalp entropy from wherever it can, frankly. And over the last 20 years, uh, the folks that have built operating systems have tried like crazy to find places they can go find entropy. Things that are not, or at least things that are not periodic. You know, nobody kids themselves that they, they will be able to find perfect randomness sitting inside a computer. But it's, at least you can find things that are not obviously periodic and are obviously not cyclical in nature. So there are, uh, you, know, you would like to think that maybe packets arriving on a network or JITO in pa packet arrival time or collision arrival time, a network is something that would be sort of random. You could think about you know, the seek time in a magnetic head on a, on a disk drive being sort of random. Um, you can try to capture entropy from the real world. You know, we all, you know, we all live in the real world and we're surrounded by entropy. You know, you know you've no doubt, you know, if you return to your physics class of, of uh, your high school years or college years, you know, you're selling lectures talking about thermodynamics and, and chaos theory and the rest of it. So that's all entropy. You know, if you drive around you know, in an old car, then the thing starts to rust under your under your feet. Not perhaps not, perhaps it doesn't because you're only brain. Well, in Boston, they rust, I'll tell you, big time. Um, and I restore Alfred Mayo, so I know an awful lot about, awful lot about rust, which is entropy. So entropy is in the real world. Trouble is, how do you get that inside a computer? Uh, so believe it or not, you know, computers do use the timing of mouse clicks, the movement of mice, you know, difference in timing of keystrokes. Um, people, believe it or not, have hooked up video cameras and pointed them at lava lamps to try and capture randomness in the local environment. It's not funny, people have actually done it. Um, and people have actually come in the following morning and the cleaners have turned the lava lamp off, which is a bit worrying if you spend the whole night encrypting your backup tape on the basis of those keys. Uh, people put up antenna and try to listen to cosmic radiation, which is very random. Trouble is the bad guy can put up the same antenna and hear exactly the same cosmic radiation that you just heard, which is not so great. So this is a, it's a weird situation. I, sometimes I think of the, the random number uh, generation task and market, such as it is, you know, it's almost like a cottage industry. You'll find, if you go scour the internet, you'll find hundreds of brilliant ideas by people who are sat in their garage or their basement to find ways of capturing entropy and try and turn it into something and try and somehow squeeze it into the operating system to make a random number uh, more random. You know, and if you owned the box and you owned the lava lamp and the camera and the application and the OS and you had it sat by your desk, then you could probably achieve a fairly high degree of randomness and a fairly high degree of confidence. But how many, you know, if you're a developer, you don't get access to all that stuff. 
you're an ops person, you don't get access to all of that stuff. You know, most of the folks that actually build data center systems only get to own one or two boxes on this diagram if they're lucky. So very few people have sort of visibility and control of the whole stack and can therefore architect a random system. You know, randomness is one of these weird things that permeates the entire stack from applications to OS to hardware, you know, even to physical environments. Which is a problem because you know we don't like doing things like that anymore. Right? We like to we like to abstract these layers right now. We like to virtualize everything. We like to drop everything into nice convenient little containers that we can fire up on you know, at, at a second's notice and tear down and move out to Amazon and ship up to Azure or put down in our basement or put it on your phone or whatever you like. Um, we like to abstract all this stuff because we like scalability, we like elasticity, we like all these buzzwords of, of cloud computing which I'm sure you've had you know, endless presentations about. Trouble is, when we abstract the software from the physical, in, physical environment and the physical hardware, we've created a boundary between the thing that actually needs entropy, the application, and the place where it actually exists in the real world. We've actually essentially created a firewall for entropy you know, in and around the hypervisor and the notion of um, abstraction. Um, and in you know, a headless system, in a data center, you know, again, we don't like entropy. We don't like randomness. We like standardized hardware. We like standardized racks. We like things to be you know, as cookie cutter as possible from a hardware point of view. And if you ship stuff out to Amazon, of course, you've got no idea what this stuff's running on at all. So your sources of entropy sort of start evaporating quite quickly when you start thinking about you know, a headless virtual machine you know, or container running in some environment over which you've got no control. And the other bad news is, of course, the other thing we like to do with virtual machines is we like to copy them. You know, we like to take our golden image, we like to go stamp out a thousand copies. Of course, when we do that, we manage to stamp out a thousand copies of the exact same state of the PRNG. So that deck we just spent all this time shuffling we now take a thousand copies of that shuffled deck and start dealing with it. So then, hardly surprising, you know, all these deals start to look the same, and that's one of the reasons why this report uh, shows a lack of entropy across multiple systems. So it's not just a case of how do we make a system secure, it's how can we convince ourselves that a thousand copies of it are independently secure from each other and are consistently secure because the security officer that is responsible for attesting to this stuff has to say, you know, every one of my web servers, or my virtual web servers, all a thousand of them, are all equally good at generating encryption keys to encrypt my web traffic. And yet in practice, of course, you know, how can they be? Because the access that any one of those virtual machines has to entropy is going to be different, and therefore, almost by definition, the ability of any virtual machine to generate a key is going to be different in terms of quality, it's going to be different than the virtual machine to the next one. So we try to introduce some notion of consistency. How can you be sure that when you generate a key, a 256-bit AES key, for example, in a virtual machine, it's got 256 bits of actual entropy? Because if it's only got 16 bits of entropy, then there's not much point in it being 256 bits long. So those of you who are familiar with, um, with Linux, um, you'll be intimately familiar with DevRandom and DevURandom. Um, which makes the point beautifully, I think. Um, so they're both random num they're both PRNGs inside Linux, and um, the difference between them is uh, one's blocking, one's, one's non-blocking. The U in DevU random, the U is for unblocking. Um, so if you ask DevU random for a random number, it will give you a random number, whatever, irrespective of how much entropy Linux, that particular copy of Linux, thinks it got available to it. Um, Whereas if you ask for a random number from dev random, Linux will only give you a random number if it thinks it has enough entropy since the last time it gave out a random number. Um, so if you fire up a virtual machine from scratch and you start trying to extract random numbers from both these two sources, you'll see that dev random is frozen for quite a while, sometimes minutes. Um, and dev u random will just give you a number, you know, hey, come what may. So the analogy I, I draw is one the equivalent of two taps. Uh, in your kitchen, you know, one's guaranteed to give drinking water that may just drip or just run dry, uh, and the other is is always going to gush water, but it might not be drinkable. Okay. So we're not necessarily saying that the view random is horribly insecure. What we're saying is you just don't know 
because Linux itself is saying, I don't have enough entropy, but I'm still going to give you a random number. So we thought this was interesting. So we, um, so we actually instrumented uh, a version of Linux to actually go capture the entropy that was being put into these PRNGs, the actual shuffling process inside uh, Linux. So this is how Linux works. Um, it's similar in Windows. We have two PRNGs on the right-hand side, dev random, dev view random. They're being shuffled by entropy in what's called the entropy pool, which can be as, as big and only as big as 4,096 bits. Linux only cares about two sources of entropy, uh, interrupts that happen on the computer, and essentially user and disk activity, uh, which also generate uh, interrupts. Uh, so two, two different paths, but essentially these random bits, such as they are, um, are fed into this thing called an entropy pool, and then whenever somebody's around a number, Linux goes to get some entropy bits from the entropy pool and shuffles it to the RNG uh, and sends out a random number. So the obvious question is, well, how good is this entropy? You know, Linux, how does Linux know whether it's got enough entropy or not? I mean, there's two issues. There's A, how many bits does it, think it, does it think it's collected in terms of entropy, and how good is the entropy? Perfect random data has 100% entropy. It's something that's entirely predictable and entirely non-uniform, but have zero bits of entropy. You know, Romeo and Shakespeare, you know, the words in the play, have entropy. Chinese has three times as much entropy as English, because in English you have a better chance of guessing what the next, what the next letter's going to be based on the letter you just heard. You know, the whole point of entropy is, if I gave you a million bits, you know, do you still have a 50-50 chance of guessing the million and one bit? Or do you have a slightly better than 50-50 chance of getting, guessing it would be a zero or a one? The more that probability shifts away from 50-50, the less entropy those million bits have got. So anyway, every time there's, a, there's, a, there's an interrupt uh, and a length machine, it throws in 16 bytes of data that it captures from the system and puts it into the entropy pool. So we thought it would be interesting to see how random that data is, since that's the source of randomness uh, in this system. So this was the data we captured. Um, don't look very random, unfortunately. Because um, the instruction point is the same. The, the interrupt requests always, always seem to come in the same place. Uh, and if you look carefully, these are counters. These aren't random numbers, they're just incrementing counters. Um, so okay, so the, the two least significant bits or so might feel vaguely random, but the six or seven most significant bits look far from random. Um, now, it's true, uh, over time, of course, this, this is subsequent samples of, of input into the entry, but well, over time, these numbers do change, and it does introduce some entropy into the system. Um, but it seems at first glance, uh, this doesn't look very random. This is what, what the entropy is. Now, Linux is, you know, isn't trying to fool anybody. Linux has a very, very conservative estimate in terms of what entropy it grants to itself when it sees these numbers being injected into the pool. Uh, but even so, you know, at first, uh, analysis these don't seem particularly random, so maybe the disk and user activity stuff is a bit more random, so we sampled that as well, and, um, and sadly it didn't look particularly random, partly because it uses the same two timers and counters uh, for, for, for half of it, uh, and the device idea is always the same, because there's only one disk drive in the system. So that's not very convincing. So, therefore, over the last 20 years, there's been a cottage industry of how do we supplement the standard or the internal entropy sources inside the computer so that we don't have to randomize all of our key generation processes using the numbers that look like that. So the good thing about entropy is um, it's, just, it's almost always additive. Now, even if I add crappy entropy to golden entropy, it still is slightly better than golden entropy. You don't dilute good entropy. Um, which means even if I do have a PRNG sitting in my operating system, and even if it does have access to some local entropy, which you've seen is not particularly great, uh, we can supplement it with other sources of entropy. And the goal here is not to have our pseudo-random number generator generate pseudo-random numbers, or deterministic random bits, if you're NIST, um, is to have these things generate true random numbers. It is possible if you seed, you know, the, 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 the villain in this piece is not the PRNG, the villain is the lack of entropy. If you seed a PRNG sufficiently often with sufficiently good stuff, 
the output is effectively a true random number. And that's the purpose of these new suites of NIST standards. One is the PRNG, one is the entropy source, and the other is how you can combine these two together to create a true high-speed random number generator. So, in terms of supplementary entropy sources, you wouldn't be surprised to know that there's loads and loads and loads of them, and they're all very different, and you have to choose. You can put them into roughly four buckets, I think, in terms of the nature of these things. So, the, in some ways, the easiest um, uh, there are software demons out there. Uh, the most famous is, uh, some people call it Havage, some people call it Havged, uh, is a software utility that basically does a better job than Linux of deriving entropy from system interrupts and system timing. So the, the data we just saw that's native in the system. Um, there were some algorithms that were invented a while back to do a better job of extracting the, the apparent randomness in those numbers, which you know, to, to the naked eye, don't seem particularly random. Um, but if you focus on the right bits of it and you look at it over long enough bits and bits of time, uh, then you can generate some better random bits, and Havage uh, does that. This stuff's free, so you can just download this. It's just the utility you load onto the machine. But it's just software, uh, and it's just using existing entropy signals within the computer. Um, the next layer up, if you like, or I guess I'll go on the next layer down, um, is how can we do a better job at extracting entropy from the physical environment around the computer. Um, it, this literally is how people did the lava lamp thing. There are, uh, again, demons out there that will uh, listen to the microphone on a laptop or on a cell phone. They will take accelerometer information from cell phones. We'll look at a video signal coming from an attached uh, video camera to try and extract randomness and entropy, uh, and again, feed that into the entropy pools in the same way. And Linux makes it very easy for these supplementary sources to drop these supplementary entropy feeds directly into the entropy pool and therefore benefit dev random and dev random. So you don't need to change your applications here at all. You just put these things in, generate supplementary entropy, drop it into the standard pool inside standard Linux, and your applications carry on pulling random numbers in the same way they always did. So in some ways this is, you know, like a flu shot. You, know, you just you don't change the way in which anybody lives, you just you just inject some new good stuff, and bingo, bad things stop happening. Um, now, of course, you know, video cameras and microphones and accelerometers you know, and network timing, none of that's perfectly random. Uh, so if you really want to be supplementing uh, these systems with an actual random entropy source, as opposed to the output of a piece of software that's trying to find randomness in something that's not particularly random, like Romeo and Juliet, um, then you have to have a hardware source. You know, at the end of the day, entropy and randomness can only come from the physical environment. Uh, and there's a wide range of these things. So a lot of chips, uh, you know, Intel has something inside some of their processes called RDRAN. Um, some of the systems on chip, uh, the small, you know, low-cost devices that go inside our IoT devices have uh, hardware entropy sources built into these things. You can buy little USB tokens for 50 bucks. Uh, that will plug into your USB slots and generate hardware randomness, you know, tens of kilobits, hundreds of kilobits maybe, uh, of pretty decent entropy. Um, PCI cards that drop inside servers if you want, even, you know, hundreds of megabits of data. So these things use um, a wide variety, and again, this is a bit of a cottage industry, uh, mechanisms to generate the randomness. You can use, you know, thermal noise or electrical noise. Um, a lot of the chip-based systems because they don't have a lot of noise inside, they go, out of, they go out of their way to get rid of noise when you make a silicon chip. Um, so they have metastable circuits, they have oscillators that point back to each other to try and sort of fight and compete for a state that generates some level of entropy. Um, all quantum sources, uh, quantum mechanics, you know, usually derived from light and the properties of light and photons, um, because, you know, according to Einstein, quantum mechanics is the only source of randomness in the universe. It is the source of randomness in the universe. Uh, so if you want perfect entropy, you know, you sort of gravitate towards uh, so-called quantum sources. If, you, if you're interested, this is a big long list, but if you go to Wikipedia, search on comparison of hardware and number generators, there's an interesting table that lists about 50 or so different flavors of hardware and number generators uh, and compares the, uh, the underlying technology uh, that yields the base entropy of the system. And 
allows you to compare prices and bandwidth and, and goodness knows what. And, and then there's an emerging area um, which I call entropy as a service, which is rather than trying to build entropy into a machine, with a piece of hardware, um, you could sample entropy over the network or be delivered entropy over the network um, as a service. So the analogy for this would be something like network time protocol. Uh, you know, we don't we don't trust our phones to each track the time of day. We don't trust our servers and our data centers to track the time of day. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we used to program these things one by one. So we program our alarm clocks. It doesn't matter if our alarm clock five minutes you know, late or early. Uh, it might be a positive advantage um, some days. Um, but when it comes to servers doing e-commerce, they have to agree on the time of day. You know, the time that we will open our or get access to our, you know, Ticketmaster tickets when they go on sale at 10 o'clock in the morning and everybody goes crazy to go buy, you know, the ticket. You know, it's important all of our computers sort of vaguely agree what time of day it is. And so we have this thing called network time. We can't trust the machine to calculate time, so we deliver time as a synchronized service over the network with potentially thousands or millions of devices. So entropy as a service is a similar argument. You can't trust the device to generate sufficient entropy, so you deliver entropy to it as a network service. There aren't many of these around. Um, there is something called random.org. Some of you may have seen it already. It's been around for a long time, 15, 20 years. Uh, comes, around, comes out of Ireland. Um, it's, a ra it's a free cloud-based random number generator. It's not, a, it's not an entropy service. So it doesn't deliver entropy into applications, but it will at least deliver uh, random numbers as a service. NIST announced a year or so ago that they were going to launch uh, a free public Entropy as a service beacon. They've had a, a beacon for a while. Um, so they were going to launch a, an entropy as a service that hasn't showed up yet, but presumably will at some point. And I think last time I heard, I'm, I'm aware of about five other companies that are working on or about to launch an entropy as a service uh, offering that could, uh, as I say, stream entropy to lots of devices. So watch this space. Uh, I put this table in. Tables are a nightmare to present, so I probably won't try. Um, but I thought you might be interested. This is my entirely subjective view on these uh, various different technologies. So, you know, just the demons, things that try to uh, extract whatever entropy exists in timing signals that exist inside the computer. Uh, I called it noisy sensors, things that try to uh, do a better job of extracting entropy from a local environment. Hardware RNGs that live inside the device or on memory sticks or on PCI cards. Uh, and then entropy as a service. Um, we can go through these later, I'm conscious of the time. So you know, in a nutshell, you know, I think these Jitter demons, they're all fine, but they're, they're basically papering over the cracks. They're trying to do a better job than Linux of extracting entropy from, in, from existing signals, and they, they work on Windows as well. Um, you know, using cameras and microphones to generate entropy, that's fun. Uh, you know, if you're at home, that doesn't really make any sense. If you're in a, in a modern data center, you know, the, uh, the lava lamp is never a very good idea. So that's great for hobbyists, but a disaster for an enterprise. Hardware RNGs are all over the map. You know, they're everything from a free corner of a chip in a CPU, you know, to a $10,000 uh, piece of hardware for generating random numbers. Um, the problem is they're all hardware, and of course these days nobody wants any hardware. We want to pretend the hardware doesn't really exist. You know? <laughs> the hardware is just part of the fabric. You know, somebody else has to worry about. All that stuff. Somebody else has to keep it cool and pay for the electricity and you know, have those big racks of stuff that are just flashing lights. But most of us, you know, just don't want to touch hardware. You don't want to buy it. You don't want to administer it. You don't want to manage it. Um, so adding adding another bit of hardware and tracking whether it's there or not and figuring out what to do if it's not there and trying to prove to yourself that when you move an application from here to here, the same bit of hardware still exists and therefore the same security claims can still be in place. As the application moves. That starts to get quite tricky when you start thinking about scale. Of course, in some situations, you have no choice. If you're trying to build you know, a high security system, you're trying to build a certificate authority for generating long-lived PKI keys, then it might well be worth building a dedicated piece of hardware to generate entropy in that device. If you're making a gaming application, you want to convince the Lotteries Commission that this thing is truly random, you might well build a physical bit of hardware and you care dearly about the hardware and you'll put an orange inside it. Um, and then I think entry to service, you could think of, to me, this, you know, this could turn out that this is a, 
just becomes one of those infrastructural services. You can imagine at some point in the future, you know, so-called secure data centers sort of being being obligated or even mandated as having an entropy supply and network a network entropy supply to supply the VMs and, and whatever other uh, application hosts live inside that environment in the same way that NTP has become essentially a standard network service within data centers. So who knows? I think that's you know two or three years away probably. Um, but you can you can see how, you know, for example, a federal security standard like FedRAMP, uh, you can imagine uh, entropy sourcing and entropy services becoming a component on a FedRAMP checklist uh, at some point. So in the spirit of full disclosure, of course, I make a bunch of this stuff. Um, you wouldn't be surprised to know. Uh, we, we do make a quantum uh, piece of hardware that people do drop into service when they build high value, high security applications. This is actually the stuff that was invented um, at Los Alamos, uh, goes crazy fast and we'll have to tell you more about it. And we do sell um, entropy to service um, systems for people to deploy into their data centers. So to wrap up, um, so cryptography is the basis of trust in the digital world. If anybody doesn't agree with that, I'm probably in the wrong room. Um, what was that phrase Mr. Trump's spokesman used? Get with the program or get out of town? But, I think that would apply to that first statement. Um, so if you think of, when anybody says cryptography, you should immediately think keys, not algorithms, keys. Um, and keys are going to become even more critical when we think about quantum safe uh, algorithms. And whenever people think about keys, you should think about random. Um, people don't think about random. People will just assume developers, you know, hey, the operating system gives me random number, it's fine. You know, the people building the hardware think, yeah, we can deliver an entropy source, but you have no idea what the application needs or what sort of security assertions are required uh, at the application. And so nobody sort of owns the problem. It's generally been taken for granted. Um, attacks are in, impossible to detect. Uh, and unfortunately, qual quality is extremely hard to measure, particularly retrospectively. Um, as we move to virtualized environments, well, we don't have any control over the hardware. We don't have any visibility over the hardware. And even if we did, it changes every 10 minutes anyway, so what does it matter? Uh, and we expect all of our IoT devices, you know, all 20 billion of them that run on batteries, you know, that, that have to live for 25 years um, and have almost nothing going on around them, and yet we expect them to be able to create perfectly trustworthy connections back to the mothership, uh, you know, to control the, the overflow gate on a dam or to, you know, download the latest firmware to control, you know, some mass transit system. Um, that's a tough ask. These things don't have a lot of entropy, yet we expect them to be hyper-secure. Um, I think the arrival of this new standard, when it comes along, will be useful and will allow us to at least get a handle on measuring the quality of random number generation and hopefully the certify systems of being up to a certain bar. Um, and when that gets fed into some of the broader crypto device uh, and security certifications, I think that's very helpful. Um, but I guess in general, my message is, you know, if you're in the security business, which uh, I think most of you are, um, you're going to be using crypto. You should at least think about where those random numbers come from. You know, how much thought have you really given that? You know, and what mechanisms could you put in place to, to see whether it really matters and whether or not any of those supplementary uh, capabilities make sense in your environment? In some cases they will, in some cases they won't. Uh, so with that, I'll say thank you. That's my email address. If anybody wants to send me uh, any questions, uh, feel free. Um, I did do a rather rather shaky demo, um, which is up on uh, it's on Vimeo, but you can get to it through uh, my website, which actually shows you. Um, so this is actually Dev Random and Dev U Random, and it shows you the speed at which these can generate random numbers without supplementary entropy sources and with supplementary entropy sources so you can sort of see a visual you know straight away aha okay so that's why it makes it makes a difference so I, if you're interested uh, watch the video uh, if you're not sick of my, my uh, voice already so uh, with that I do have some freebies of course you wouldn't come to this sort of event unless you have some freebies so these are um, uh, lens caps for your, uh, for your um, laptop or for so if you're the sort of person that likes to do their email in their in the PJs, or uh, you know, or uh, you know, lying in bed, or doing their uh, their, their, uh, their conference calls, 
you know, no amount of cryptography is going to save you. This is what you need. Something, <laughs> something. You know, this is physical security. So if you're one of these, uh, no, I, yeah, well, at least, um, I'm, I'm sure at least half of you, I guarantee, have got a bit of sticky tape stuck over your camera lens. Um, I used to be in the video conferencing and video phone industry, and I always knew the market for lens caps was always going to be way bigger than the market for video phones. But if you'd like one, unfortunately, I don't have enough for probably even a third of the room, but that's all I could carry. Anyway, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Richard. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to take any. Uh, I don't know if you want to take any questions. We probably have a few minutes for a few questions. If anybody has any questions. Thank you to the folks online, by the way. I appreciate it. It's tough. I know it's tough listening to things on, online. You don't quite feel the you know, connection. So I was curious, uh, is there anything in the natural world that provides real entropy, like the position of this swallow to that swallow, or the depth of the oceans, or like any, is that, or is that stuff all reasonably predictable? Um, well, if you believe Newton, then all of it's predictable. Yeah. If you believe Einstein, then quantum mechanics is, is you know, the uncertainty principle. It's, you know, that's, that's the root of, of natural randomness. So cosmic radiation is perfectly random. The trouble is it's not secret. So making making cryptographic keys, you know, if you have you have other requirements beyond just random. It actually needs it actually be, it actually needs to be random, it needs to be secret, and it needs to be unperturbable. So having a random source that can be changed by somebody wave a wave a radio antenna over it or play around with your power supplies or hey, that's not much good either. So Randomness is, an, is, is one of the legs of the stool, but, um, but secrecy and imperturbability is the other leg. But yeah, quantum mechanics is, um, you know, some would argue, I think even I would argue, and I have physicists would definitely argue, is the only source of pure randomness in the universe. And that's what we use, so I can talk endlessly about <laughs> how you do quantum mechanics. It's not explained. Thank you. Uh, two things. Um, number one, I had a math professor, and it was a long time ago, so I may not remember correctly, but it was that a truly random number doesn't really exist except as an abstract thought. That was just, and, and so I'll let you comment on that. But then my real question, as I, I live in a world of um, NIST specifications and guidelines. Lucky so you. Can, yes, yes, I'm very fortunate. Some people get all the jobs. Right. Can you, um, can you give a brief description of how NIST intends to measure or have different degrees of assurance in terms of the random numbers and how good or bad they are? Um, yes. Yeah, so I mean, the first question, is it possible to make a random number? Um, it, it becomes a philosophical point. I think you're right in the end. And the answer is probably no. Um, because you know, with, with random, trying to prove randomness is trying to prove the absence of correlation and the absence of any bias. So the question is, how long do you look? You know, it's like trying to prove the absence of anything. I could, I can't prove to you that it's not going to rain tomorrow until we get to midnight tomorrow. Um, so with a random number, you know, if I, you know, if I gave you a gigabit of data and you you scoured it for a thousand years and convinced yourself there was absolutely no pattern, it was a perfect, you know, 50-50 bias of ones and zeros. You don't know that the next bit that comes along, or if you were to scour it for another four seconds, you'd find something in that data. You know? So the acid test of randomness is how big a data set are you prepared to measure and how long are you prepared to measure it for. And um, so NIST, I think, requires um, 10 megabits of data. Some other tests are a megabit or even 100 kilobits of data. So we, you know, we do tests on 25 gigabits and gigabytes of data. Um, some of these tests run for two weeks, you know, on multiple machines. So it's just a question of how hard you're prepared to look in terms of how confident are you going to be in your assertion that any bit of data is random. And of course, you know, even things that might look totally unrandom, you know, I, you know, a string of a million zeros looks incredibly unrandom, but it's a perfectly legitimate output for a random number generator. So the, I mean, there, are, there have even been examples where people have written random number generators and have tried to spot long runs of zeros and ones and artificially change them back into something that looks a bit more random, which is sort of, 
which is sort of pointless. So you have to be sort of careful. You know, if somebody says anything perfectly random, then they, they might well be deluding themselves. Um, I mean, we so we have a you know we have a quantum random number generator which you know uses the best uh, entropy source in theory. You know, the universe has provided us. Uh, and I think we measure its entropy at like 99.7 percent because that's the degree to which we can test. Um, but so your second question is how to NIST test this stuff. So the reason why it's taken this, I think, five or six years to try and this test suite is because it's not, it's not very easy. Um, so they have, a, they have a threshold. They call it IID, independent identically distributed data. So they do a basic test on the data and decide whether or not it qualifies as being IID. IID, independently identically distributed, is essentially my first slide about the dice. So the bits seem to be uniformly distributed. And, of, you know, and with no bias. So if you can get to that threshold, you can just about claim that you're a random number generator. Uh, if you don't, then you're a non-IID source, which is, you know, bad news. And if you are an IID source, then you can, then there are tests that will measure the apparent entropy in 100 megabits of data. And you end up with an entropy score in terms of bits per bit of entropy. So, you know, you'd like to believe that you're into the, you know, 7.9 something bits of entropy per bytes of data. Some of that uh, some of that Linux stuff that we tested um, is down at about 0.2 bits of entropy per byte, which is horrible. It's an interesting spec to read. It does get into some of the philosophical questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, we're not going to have much more time for questions. You answer. could probably reach out to him and, and uh, pose some questions to him directly. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, also, I was asked if uh, there's anybody uh, want to announce any uh, job openings. 